From our first lesson, we learned that God is no respecter of persons. For he is a God of justice, we learn, who knows no favorites. Though not unduly partial toward the weak, yet he hears the cry of the oppressed. In other words, from the Pope to the lowliest layman, from the President of the United States to the janitor working without notice in the basement of the White House, we stand on equal footing before the divine majesty, the divine justice. For we all stand before him as we really are, not as we may appear to be to others. In truth, we are naked, as it were, before his gaze, from which nothing or no one can be hidden. Every thought, every deed, every aspect of our character, each admirable quality and characteristic, every flaw. We see this set forth vividly in the parable of today's gospel. The setting is the temple. The persons involved are a Pharisee and a tax collector or a publican, same thing. And of course, Almighty God who sees all things. And the Pharisee, and it was not just the Pharisees that were of this ilk, and not all the Pharisees were, but many were. The Pharisee stands before God in his own righteousness, convinced of his rectitude, that he is better than other men far above them. And he points that out. He reminds God of that. And of course, the things that he does are not in of themselves inappropriate or wrong or evil. They're good. But it's the spirit in which he is doing them that is the problem. The publican, on the other hand, the tax collector, he stands before God and begs for his mercy. It is not the outward appearance of either one which determines their respective destinies, and it is not the outward appearance of any of us that determines our destinies, but the disposition of the heart, understood as that very center and core of who we really are and those actions which with integrity flow from it. The Pharisee displayed for all the world to see his righteous deeds, which were but a cloak of self-respect for his sinful and prideful heart, the real motive, the real center of all his actions. The publican, on the other hand, the tax collector, sought not to hide his true state before God. He was indeed a sinner which openness and honesty revealed not only his sin, but also his deep humility, his humble and contrite heart, the genuine source of his sincere penance and repentance. The Roman Catechism has taught us down through the years, and I quote, the first preparation then for prayer is an unfeigned humility of soul an acknowledgement of our sinfulness and a conviction that when we approach God in prayer, our sins render us undeserving, not only of receiving or propitious hearing from him, but even of appearing in his presence. And as the holy sacrifice of the mass, the Holy Eucharist is the supreme and the superlative prayer. We may substitute the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, or the Holy Eucharist, or both, for prayer in that statement which I just read. And then we have the first preparation for the Holy Eucharist is a genuine humility of soul, an acknowledgement of our sinfulness, and a conviction that when we approach God in the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass, our sins render us undeserving, not only of receiving a propitious hearing from him, but even of appearing in his presence. That is the spirit of the publican. Oh, the prayer of my priestly heart is that we, as the people of God, might once again be filled with such a spirit of humble contrition 
before the transcendent holiness of the divine majesty of God's glory, and especially so in the Holy Eucharist, at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Today's Gospel teaches us that it is with such humble and contrite hearts that we are to live our Catholic faith before our God with integrity, humbly conforming our lives to its contours, so that we, one day, at the end of our earthly pilgrimage, can say with the Apostle Paul in true humility, I am already being poured out like a libation, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. This word to Timothy is at once so very tender, and yet with a tenderness which is strong, heroic, manly, and humble, humble of heart. Although moving, it is far from sentimental. May God deliver us from sentimentality. It's very destructive. Timothy had been consecrated by the Apostle Paul as a bishop in Ephesus. Timothy had always been able to turn to the Apostle Paul in times of crisis and get his wise, aged, and apostolic counsel. And now, the man upon whom he had depended all those years was being taken from him. His head would be severed from his body at Nero's command. And so Timothy must have read and reread these words with tears blurring his eyes. But even so, every line, even the example, especially the example of the Apostle Paul, braced him with power to make him, in all humility, valiant to contend in the noble contest for the faith, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. And so these inspired words and examples strengthen us, or so they should, And then we too, by God's inestimable grace, communicated to us by word and sacrament, through the abundance of the divine mercy, will contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, like the Apostle Paul and his apostolic vicar, Timothy, which in our time of necessity must involve the issues of life and the gospel of life. And during this Respect Life Month, I would be remiss and derelict in my pastoral duty if I did not mention the defense of the unborn, standing against our culture's contraceptive mentality, caring for not killing the sick, the disabled, the elderly, and the terminally ill. A couple of Sundays ago, right before Mass, and I think it was the 11 o'clock Mass, but as I told the 9 o'clock, it could have been the 9, vice versa. But it was right before Mass. I had just gotten a drink of water, and I was coming around the corner in the vestibule to join the others before Mass began. And there was an older gentleman there whom I have never seen before. And he may be here every Sunday. There are many of you that I haven't seen before. You understand? It's a big place. But I had not seen him before. And he went past me, and he stopped. And he came back or turned around, and he had almost a sneer on his face. And he said, Shirley, you're not going to talk about abortion again. And I simply said, have a good day, sir. But in my heart, I said, get behind me, Satan. His eminence, Cardinal Burke, The head of the highest court of the church in Rome has written, and I quote, in the present situation of our world, the Christian faith has a critical responsibility to articulate clearly the natural moral law and its demands. Under the constant influence of a rationalist and secularist philosophy, which makes man instead of God the ultimate measure of what is right and good, 
Many have become confused about the most basic truths. For example, the inviolable dignity of innocent human life from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death and the integrity of marriage between one man and one woman as the first and irreplaceable cell of the life of society. If Christians fail to articulate and uphold the natural moral law, then they fail in the fundamental duty of patriotism, of loving their country by serving the common good. In our present circumstances, many of the Pharisees, like the one in today's gospel, are Catholics who profess to be such, and yet by their actions and their deeds support the culture of death and all that goes with it. That's the Pharisee, the self-righteous Pharisee. What God asks of us is integrity, not necessarily success, but faithfulness to him and his gospel. Which brings us back to the point that if we contend for the faith, once for all delivered to the saints, which of necessity in our time and our culture involves contending for the gospel of life, we by God's grace with the apostle will be able to say, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the righteous Lord, the judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. And so at this Holy Eucharist, what can be more useful? As the Catechism further teaches, what better calculated to subdue the pride and haughtiness of the human heart, most especially our own? than to reflect on the amazing fact that God humbles himself in such a matter as to assume our frailty and weakness in order to communicate to us his life and glory, that God becomes man and that he at whose nod, to use the words of scripture, the pillars of heaven tremble and are affrighted in this Holy Eucharist, bows his supreme and infinite majesty to minister to you and to me his body and blood, his soul and divinity. For a moment, think upon the crucifix, the supreme symbol of him who is offered on this holy altar. And in the words of the poet, in this holy mass, see from his head, his hands, his feet, love and sorrow flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? Let us then, like the publican of old, in this God's holy temple, humble ourselves before the majestic mercy of the humility of God. Then, if we do, we too will go home justified. In this humble weakness, lies our true, noble, and manly strength. For in the words of our Lord in today's gospel, everyone who exalts himself will be humble, and the one who humbles himself will be exalted. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.